good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar that we are focused on the currency market. Um, we have with us uh, Thomas. Thomas is a dear friend of the firm. Uh, he has presented to uh, our clients uh, maybe Thomas, what, uh, 10 years ago in Bahrain. Um, he, he, when he was at, still at Goldman Sachs, so Thomas today is running his own uh, business. Um, it's a currency specialist house called Embankment Currency Research. Uh, before that, he was at Goldman Sachs for 15 years as head of uh, the currency research and strategy. He focused a lot on quantitative model, capital flows. Uh, he studied economics, statistics in Germany. He lives in, uh, and he lived in France. He's now in the UK, so he's a very global uh, currency uh, strategist. And we're really glad to have uh, you, Thomas, with us today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be back, really, um, uh, having uh, having followed your growth uh, and development over the years as well. It's uh, quite impressive. Um, but right, so I've got a presentation uh, today with a few slides. It will probably take about I got 15 minutes or so to go through the slides, and then um, and then uh, we have basically time to talk about uh, what more, more questions. Um, happy to take questions. I think there's a possibility to, to ask questions even during the presentation. Um, I think it goes via the chat, if I understand this correctly. And uh, and then we can see what comes in and, and try to answer them when, when I'm done with the with the formal formal part. So don't hesitate if there's anything unclear. I like just sh shoot off the question. I might see it and might be able to explain it straight away uh, if, if, if I'm focused on this. So, um, so the, the, the main point today is uh, the main presentation, and I've got a title. Let me try to share this here at the same time I'm talking. Uh, so the, main, the main idea is that after really many, many years of not much happening at all in the foreign exchange market, uh, things are really starting to come back uh, quite significantly. And that is, um, in, many, in many respects, it reminds me of, of the 1990s, the 1980s. So I'm... I'm, I'm now getting older, but I'm not necessarily that old that I actually experienced everything in 1980s. But it is, it is actually, it's actually true that my, my interest in, in economics, general economics, came uh, during the period uh, of extreme currency market swings uh, arose in the 1980s. Um, I will come back to this later on, at the Plaza Accord, the Louvre Accord in, in, in uh, 83 and 85. And so that was about the time when I was in the last few years at school, and and then pretty much afterwards I headed to university and studied economics. So I have a, I have a remember I remember some of these things actually quite well, and and I have to say in many respects what goes on at the moment uh, is uh, is 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 quite comparable or, or at least there are a lot of parallels which are interesting. So um, uh, let's start straight away. So. That is the issue, obviously. The reason why everything looks so similar to what we've seen in like 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, is, uh, is because we see the biggest inflation shock that we have seen since, uh, since that period of time. So, so it's, always, it's always interesting to say inflation is a, is a problem, but what is important uh, to understand, and, and people often forgot this uh, even last year when inflation started to go up, that if inflation is starting to go up, it becomes a massive policy issue, uh, and and uh, policymakers uh, in governments, but in particular in central banks, are under under enormous pressure. And 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 measuring how the population responds to inflation is not all that easy. Uh, and and one relatively simple way is is just to look at Google Trends. So this is basically the the number of times people search for the word inflation on Google. And I, I selected here a very broad chart, so it's it's uh, it's a simple term inflation. It's a worldwide search terms. It's as far along as Google goes. This is 2004, so we can't really go back to the 90s and the 80s because there was no internet at the time, and uh, and therefore also no Google. And so, but you see that that since the since the early 2000s, uh, we have not seen so much interest, uh, and I would say worry uh, about uh, about this uh, the subject of inflation. And um, and it's 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 uh, it's disconcerting for people, right? I mean, it's 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 an it's a big issue for people uh, 
because they don't know how much they can spend, how much they can budget going forward, and, and they go to the shop, everything has gone up again. And, uh, and, and it creates uncertainty. Even if wages go up at the same time, which is typically what happens in the wage price spiral, you're never quite sure whether your personal wages are actually going up just as much as your, as your inflation basket, what you're, what you're spending in the shops in addition. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very potential big issue. Now, the problem that central bankers have, and that I'm gradually moving to, to the implication for the foreign exchange market, is that the central bankers have a really, really difficult job at the moment. I mean, uh, the title in this chart, they're about to put millions in the misery. It's very clear. I mean, we used to talk in the 1980s about, uh, in the 1990s still, but then it started to slow down. We, we talked about the sacrifice ratio. That's a measure that linked to the Phillips curve, but basically it tells you how much more unemployment do you have to accept as a policymaker in order to bring inflation down to a certain target level. So, um, so we're not quite there yet in terms of the debate, the public debate at the moment, right? If you if you see central bankers say, oh, we need to go, we need to hike a little bit more, we need to slow down the economy, that's actually pain. So that means that means there will be a very significant uh, loss of, uh, uh, of of employment, and it also means if you go back uh, to the 1980s, uh, it also means that inflation really. Uh, needs to be lower than the interest rates. So we need a positive real rate. Uh, so we don't know exactly where inflation is going and the central banks predict it's going to come down a little bit. Um, but when I look at 10% uh, inflation or so in the US at the moment, and I see that the markets are pricing in that Fed fund uh, rates will be peaking at about let's say three, three and a quarter percent, something along those lines, then we still having, we assume that inflation stays at 10%, we're still having a negative real rate of 7%. That's, it remains an exceptionally accommodative monetary policy. So the chances are that, um, that either inflation really needs to drop down sharply uh, or interest rates will have to go a lot higher. But what does it really mean? It means that central banks will have to Put people into unemployment. It will. It will need. It will need. It will mean that central banks will have to kill businesses which are over leveraged that will fail, uh, struggle to pay back debt. And central bankers are unelected officials. They are supposed to be independent, but they're not really independent because they get nominated. Uh, they go through a, a, a here. They, they sometimes lose their independence. Right. I mean, think how. Think how aggressively. Uh, the Trump administration was battering the Fed at the time to to lower interest rates. So central bankers are never truly independent. They ultimately depend uh, on what the country and the population in the country wants. And uh, and and given that they have either the bad job of letting inflation run away or the bad job of killing the economy, they are struggling at the moment. And so as a result of that, the central banks behave in a slightly different way. So so you have some central banks just wait and move slowly and to some extent they hope that the problem goes away so the ecb is often in that camp uh having 20 plus people in the governing council uh, is obviously not very helpful if you want to react quickly um but uh but they are they are they tend to be a little bit on the slow side and it takes a long time before they move then you have those who are acting early and try to preempt and uh, try to make things uh, as little uh, painful in the long run as possible. There's actually a very good article by Martin Wolf in the Financial Times uh, today about this, where he made this analogy and goes back in time and says, well, we need to really, we need to, central banks need to act quickly and early uh, to bring this problem under control. And, uh, and I think the only central bank that we see act along those lines at the moment is possibly overnight, we've seen the RBNZ in New Zealand, who's really been acting um, uh, after a very radical U-turn at the end of last year, now quite quite rapidly, um, and uh, and then you have <clears throat> then you have other central banks who who choose an, an, a different strategy, and that started already last year. For example, in, in Switzerland, the SNB did this, uh, and it uh, it um, let the currency strengthen. So that's a strategy that is open essentially only to small open economies, where the advantage of a stronger currency is twofold. On one hand, your import prices are going down, particularly when you're an energy importer, that's very helpful. So that mechanically brings down inflation. 
and a stronger currency also tends to weaken the export competitiveness and therefore weakens the domestic uh, the domestic export sector. So that's very the, the second part is particularly welcome uh, for the central bankers because always think that the central bankers need to put people out of jobs ultimately and create individual misery uh, when they fight inflation. And if they can blame the exchange rate for some of the job that they need to do, then they're very happy about this. So central banks are very, very, very happy in, in periods of rate hikes uh, if they can if they can do a little bit less and let the currency do some of the work. By the way, that is, uh, we're now going back to the 1990s, that was the original logic of the strong dollar policy, which was uh, engineered uh, at the time by um, by uh, Greenspan, Rubin, and uh, and Summers uh, uh, in the uh, Fed Governor and, and Treasury Secretary, and and um, uh, and they um, they in the mid 90s because the Fed was in a hiking cycle and they didn't want to hike as much uh, as they had to do. They tore the dollar up as an idea to reduce uh, some of the import prices and to some extent to to import disinflation and to slow down the economy without actually having to do it through the interest rates. The time the, the government had a lot of debt and high interest rate would have been potentially destabilizing for the government, uh, for the government debt situation. And therefore, the high, the strong dollar policy was precisely one of these at, at the origin afterwards, people just talked about it. But, um, but the original concept of the strong dollar policy was precisely to try to reduce the inflation pressures, therefore let the currency strengthen. So there's a lot going on in terms of differences of central bank policies. And, and to bring this down to the foreign exchange markets, I did, I did a bit of a calculation here. So don't be scared by this chart. Um, um, the idea is actually relatively simple. So what I look at is I take the 10 central banks in uh, the 10 central banks in the G10, the G10 currency, the most liquid currencies. And I look at the 12 month interest rates and how these 12 month interest rates change over a period of a year. So if it's, if the central bank suddenly start to hike, uh, quite dramatically, then these 12 month interest rates will be moving up very rapidly. The central bank that doesn't do anything there, the 12 month interest rate will be moving barely and will stay at zero. <clears throat> so you see basically the changes in the interest rate. And then if you look at the cross-sectional standard deviation. So that's basically the, the, the deviation dispersion of the different countries, the 10 countries. Then you can see they all move in the same way, identical hikes or identical do nothings, then the dispersion would be zero. So we would be seeing something that's very close to zero in, in, in this chart. Uh, and that, that's something what we've seen from 2013 to 2021 where basically there was very little dispersion in global interest rate policy. Uh, and as a result of that, there wasn't really much happening in, in, in foreign exchange markets either. Um, so if you go back a little bit, we can see during the crisis situation. So we see here uh, towards the left of the chart, the 2008 and 2009 period of the global financial crisis. There we had obviously in the crisis response uh, quite significant differences. Um, we also had then subsequently in the initial recovery, we had a bit of differences. Remember, we had the ECB briefly high rates even, only then to cut subsequently. That was 2011, now widely seen as a big policy error. But there was the Fed state on hold. <clears throat> the Norwegians were the very first to hike in Australia at the time. So there was, there was clearly quite a bit of dispersion at the time, but it was quite a bit less actually even during that post-global financial crisis period than what we're seeing at the moment. And actually even and even um, even the peak periods in the global financial crisis were, were just very short um, uh, of dispersion. And then very quickly, central banks kind of realigned themselves again. So, um, so we are here at a very high level. We haven't really seen this kind of level apart from short spikes of, of, of risk aversion uh, on a sustained basis since this chart 2004. And now I, go actually further back and then I started struggled with the data. So I, I could go back to the early 90s. And so you can see these periods of, of central banks uh, moving in opposite direction or different directions. And uh, you really have to go back basically to the 1990s. If you make the exclusion of the uh, of the global financial crisis uh, period uh, to go to see this kind of dispersion that we see in, in global central bank policy. And um, and 
and that is very very significant change compared to the the whatever seven eight years of of basically totally dormant foreign exchange markets uh, with with virtually uh, with virtually no no volatility whatsoever and um and it's quite interesting to to see what this period this green period that i marked here with with perfect central bank uh, synchronization did to foreign exchange trading returns so um so i used here um uh, a hedge fund uh, a specialized hedge fund return index the eureka hedge fx hedge fund index and it's a total return index basically tells you how how these, uh, how these, uh, in average, the average FX hedge fund has been doing during that period, and and so you see quite clearly this this two green periods here. If you, if I go back to the slide, to the previous slide, it corresponds to basically the period around 2006. This period here from 2013 onwards to 2021. This green period in this in this chart corresponds to these two green dots here, and basically there were no returns. Um, there was no volatility in the markets, but it's less volatility. It's actually, it's more like directional differences, right? It's, it's more about currencies appreciating on a more sustained basis or not. So we're talking here more about moderate trends, intermediate trend that lasts a few months, maybe a few quarters, uh, while central banks move in opposite directions and then they come back. We didn't have that. If anything, we had central banks, as soon as their currency started to strengthen, central banks came into the market and started talking or actually cut the interest rates often with the aim of, of bringing the exchange rate back down after it has started to appreciate. But then look at this last bit. I mean, that's why it's so interesting. Uh, and that's why I think I mean, so it, precisely at the time where, where, the, where we have this very significant dispersion in, in, uh, in, uh, in monetary policies, as I showed in the previous charts, we see that the returns are picking up in, uh, in in foreign exchange trading again. Uh, there are trends that are tradable, there are movements that are tradable. The move in the yen was significant. Uh, it started last year to some extent, it's been accelerating a lot during this year. Uh, and um, and as long as central banks are so focused on, on getting a grip on inflation as their primary objective, they will not be focusing as much on the exchange rate. So I would expect this dispersion to persist for a while and therefore I would expect these trading opportunities to last. And if this inflation shock is a very significant shock, and the chances aren't bad for that, actually, then we might be talking about a regime shift that can last if quite a few years, actually, uh, where we will see very significant, very significant moves in the currency market as a result of, of, of these big differences between the, uh, between the different central banks. So when we're talking about this, so we're talking about, um, we're talking about potentially significant interest rate differentials. So um, they're starting to materialize already. So it's not just about changes in interest rates, so central banks hiking or not. It's also the end state might be very difficult, different. So if you think that the US has uh, much more fiscal stimulus than most other countries in the world, therefore more inflationary pressures potentially than other countries in the world, and therefore potentially also much higher interest rates in the end state of the cycle than other countries in the world, then you can see that the dollar could be very, very strong at some stage. Uh, and, and the carry, it would not be the change in interest rate, it would also be the nominal carry that people can earn there. So this is why, and now I'm going really back to the 80s and actually even into the 1970s. So this is the entire history of the dollar uh, in floating exchange rates. So this is the, the, the real, that means inflation adjusted uh, dollar index calculated by the Fed, the Federal Reserve in the US, and it's against the major trading partners, or they have rebranded the index called now the Advanced Foreign Economies Index. Um, but uh, that is basically the, the reference index for the trade rated dollar, the real inflation adjusted trade rated dollar. And so uh, you can see what happened to the dollar last time when the Fed finally decided to do the necessary bits. Uh, the, the dollar went essentially into an overvaluation of about 40, 40%. The long run average here in this chart is not 100, it's actually slightly above, it's about 105. And so we had a brief spike to 40% overvaluation of the dollar when interest rates were in the US at 20% and inflation was at 15%. Uh, and uh, uh, people talk about this a lot, so I'm, I'm not going to go too much into that. But I would also highlight the period just before, if you go to the mid 70s, the so 78 or something like that, there the dollar was about 15% undervalued. And that was the time when 
the Fed was behind the curve, was not hiking sufficiently when interest rates were four or five percent below the inflation rate. Uh, and that is an environment where we have actually quite significant potential disinflation, uh, depreciation forces uh, uh, um, acting on a currency. So this, this big move up was obviously uh, a great trading opportunity, but it was also quite difficult trading. If you think from 78 to, 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 from, to 1980s, the early 1980s, because there were a lot of swings, but it also people need to remember or, or recognize that essentially the interest rate policies at the time was a function of monetary so money supply policy. So, so the, uh, even under Falker in the first years, uh, in, the, in 1980, uh, the interest rate jumped several times during the year from 15% up to 20%, back down to 15%, up to 20%. So the, the way monetary policy, was, monetary policy was conducted was very different to, to the way it's being done today. So that created volatility. So I wouldn't expect these very sharp jumps that you see around the early 80s, for example, uh, these up and down zigzag move. But the total extent of overvaluation, the 40%, that we have seen when interest rates were so high, that's absolutely possible again. So that's why at the end I'm adding my my three arrows there because I'm not I'm it, it depends quite clearly on, on on what is going to happen and how policies are going to react and and also how quickly it's very difficult to predict uh, how quickly is inflation to become the top policy issue. And and if you read old newspaper articles from the early 80s and the late 70s. Elections were being lost on inflation. Um, uh, um, Carter, the Carter administration, lost its uh, the the, the re-election or Carter uh, re lost the re-election bid uh, partly because he couldn't get inflation under control. And at some stage, people are screaming to get it under control. And at some stage, people in the population are widely willing to accept the economic pain that is necessary in order to bring it under control. And that's the moment when you get these really big moves in the currency market. So. It can happen. Maybe maybe they get under control earlier. If not, then we will either we get either we get the correction relatively quickly. If not, we potentially head towards a move like that. But but it's important also to realize after a period of extreme overvaluation, uh, the forces of equilibrium in the foreign exchange market are very strong, and actually the best trading opportunities ever in in the dollar trading were in the late 80s, in the mid 80s, uh, when we came back from this 40% overvaluation that was initially the Plaza Accord, which was signed uh, among the, the major countries in, uh, in, uh, in, in 83. And then once the dollar had collapsed within three years by 40% or 50%, then the Louvre Accord signed in Paris uh, was then by, by the same uh, Japan, the US uh, and, and uh, France and Germany. Uh, the Lure Accord was uh, was then trying to stabilize the exchange rate, and then from the late 80s there was very active currency intervention among the G7 countries, uh, or then G5 countries, in order to try to stabilize the exchange rate. But this move down was one of the best trading opportunities ever uh, in foreign exchange market. And we had then the second one, which was um, which was after the global financial no, after the the tech bubble burst uh, in, uh, in in early 2003. We again had a had a very strong. Uh, trading opportunity uh, in this. So I try to illustrate this by, by have built a, I've built a very simple momentum trading strategy. It's, it's, not, it's not clean, it's not adjusted for transaction costs. It's basically just taking the signal and looking at the, at the average returns during that period. But the idea of what this, this is a total return strategy. And, and as so often when you do systematic uh, FX trading strategies, you see that these things don't work for long periods of time. And then suddenly they knock out the lights. And so you can see here, for example, that this, this Plaza Louvre period in the, in the mid 80s that corresponds to this very sharp decline after the overvaluation uh, created a 50% return uh, on, um, uh, on, uh, on the, over a two period, two year period. And then the second, the second great episode that was after the, after the, uh, the 2003 period when the euro came from deep sub parity level, I think it hit, it hit even sub 80, uh, 0.8 uh, at the time, if I recall this correctly. And then it started this, this big ascent, which ultimately ended in 2008 at, at 160. Or so that was another great, great trading opportunity. So in both cases, it was actually the dollar getting weaker uh, during that time. 
Uh, I'm not sure whether this is the case again, but the key point here is that we had we had very big overvaluations at the time, and they created huge trading opportunities. And given what's happening in, in, in interest rate markets at the moment and in central bank policy uh, differentiation, the chances for very significant over and under valuations are high. But let me emphasize this is not a dollar story. This is a story that can happen in any G7 currency, right? It's possible that the New Zealand dollar at the moment is the one that is most likely to show an overvaluation of that extent because the RBNZ is one of the most actively hiking central banks at the moment. Uh, it could be it could be that the Bank of England, uh, which seems to be already backpedaling and trying to maybe signaling that they will be slowing with their rate hikes, uh, might be the one that sees their currency extremely undervalued and uh, and then may have to act and then you see a sterling recovery afterwards. So the key is here not to focus too much on the dollar. The key is to focus on the differences between the different countries and to figure out who is actually really active. To act, act. And that is ultimately, I'm, I'm adamant about this, it's ultimately a question of the willingness of the population to take pain to get rid of inflation. I think it's not about what's, it's not let that much about central bank communication because central banks in the current situation, they are also lost like everyone else. They will only pick up what is the key issue what people really want, where the where the population is screaming, and then they will ultimately deliver the policy that is uh, that that works accordingly. So um, we talk about big misalignments. We're talking about equi equilibrium forces. I, I wanted to highlight the dollar is already. Let me go back two slides. The dollar is already quite significantly overvalued at the moment. It's, it's about uh, twenty percent, uh, twenty percent overvalued. It's, the biggest overvaluation we've seen since the early 2000s. Um, and we can see already that the equilibrium forces are working in the back background. So this is the trade balance in the US, which is in near free fall right now. Uh, so a strong dollar gives the American public a lot of purchasing power that deals into imports to a large extent. But it's also the strong fiscal stimulus in the US that gives people a lot of money to, to spend. And a lot of this extra demand in, a, in the economy that's over-simulated leaks abroad. So we have a large duration account account and a trade balance. And that means ultimately that as soon as people will no longer buy dollars because of the higher interest rates, that current account deficit or trade deficit will be incredibly difficult to fund, which is the reason why after these big overvaluation drives, we then have a very sharp correction afterwards, typically. So that's the moment the interest rates are going down. Money is no longer flowing into the country. The trade deficit is still there. People are still used to buy stuff abroad, and then the currency suddenly collapses. So I'm not saying the dollar is going down. I actually think the dollar is going up first, but I can see here in this chart already that the seed is being lay down for a very significant correction after the current overvaluation uh, of the dollar. And so I'm now coming just to the to the last to the last chart here in, in this presentation, moving completely away from the G10 currencies. Uh, it's, it's, it's a slightly different story here, but it's also related to inflation. Uh, this is the emerging market world. And uh, and it's, they work slightly differently in, in an inflation stock. Emerging markets tend to uh, be more reactive and and faster when a macroeconomic shock hits, and it's largely the result of much less reputation. So, uh, who, if you have the chance, if you have the choice between uh, trusting the, uh, the, let's say, Brazilian or Argentine or Mexican or any emerging market central bank or the Federal Reserve, you would give the Federal Reserve way, way, way more credit that they're able to get inflation under control than all the others. As a result of that, emerging market central banks have to react very quickly. And when inflation is starting to be a problem, people run away and just don't want to be there. That means that the central banks have to hike very, very aggressively in order to stabilize their currencies. Because remember, central banks by and large want to have a stronger currency when they have an inflation problem. And that is true, as particularly for small emerging market countries as well. And if you look at Brazil, for example, last year, they were among the first to hike. They hiked very aggressively. They continue to hike. They have now one of the highest interest rates in the world. And yes, the Brazil real rallied quite significantly at the beginning of the year, but it's still very weak uh, in the long term comparison. And uh, and that despite interest rates being now quite high in Brazil. So we need potentially even higher interest rates uh, and, and interest rates which are significantly higher than inflation. We're talking about the positive real rates before uh, investors are starting to go back in. And so this is about risk premium, a risk premium. Uh, 
Uh, what you notice in these periods that that uh, after a macro crisis, macro uncertainty, uh, a crash like in Turkey, uh, we very very high interest rates, well above inflation levels before these countries are stabilizing, and that is then creating uh, very strong uh, risk premium, very high risk premium for investors. And so it's a way to look at this, and it's, I built here a very simple, naive. FX carry strategy in the M space purely that basically you you hold you look at every day you rank all the emerging market currencies by interest rates you're not not even doing not even doing an inflation adjustment you just look at who's got the highest interest rates and uh, and and then and then you go long though so the guys with the highest interest rates tends to be obviously also those which have the high, had the highest inflation particularly in the past. And what you can see here is that in 2002 to 2004, 5, 6, we had absolutely astronomically high in, uh, returns in the strategy. And by the way, that was largely driven by Turkey at the time. Um, now, Turkey was a, Turkey had blown up in 2002. So no one with the same mind was at the time willing to invest in Turkey. Uh, and if anything, if you go back from the mid-90s with the, the Mexican tequila price crisis to further the Asian crisis in the late 90s, then we had uh, then we had Argentina, Turkey, the last ones to blow up. Uh, the tech bubble in between had also burst. Uh, so we had we had emerging markets um, going down one after the other. General risk aversion super high. No one wanted to invest in anything risky at the time, and you had enormously high returns. But no one did it. <laughs> so very few people did it. So as people realized over time how juicy these returns were, and because they looked at starts like that one. Uh, they increasingly started to go into it, and when we had the we had after the global financial crisis, uh, we had um, the wall of money hitting emerging markets, and everybody was looking for returns. Uh, the returns went down to zero, basically. So the currency depreciation in these countries, every, anything you earned and carry, you lost straight away through currency depreciation. Basically, it means that the risk premium had gone down to zero, and there was no compensation for the risk you were taking. Uh, or, or just about a fair compensation, but there was nothing you earned in reality. And um, and and so after now, I don't know, 15 years or so of very weak returns in the emerging markets, uh, where basically too many people had oh too much money invested in that place, uh, people have been running away. I mean, uh, you see already the returns have been starting to go up. And if you look at uh, if you look at the very last bit in this chart where I've put this exclamation mark. Uh, these are probably the strongest the returns over a two or three month period ever witnessed in this chart. But look what the strategy is long at the moment. It's all the stuff that no one wants to have. <laughs> you have Turkey in there, you have Ruble in there, you have Brazil in Brazil, you have heading into election. Three countries with a, with a populist uh, government um, and, uh, and, and all having had very significant currency volatility in the last two years. And uh, a notorious short position in Brazil, which has been outstanding for a long period of time. Turkey, we don't even have to talk about uh, uh, Erdogan's uh, very special interest rate policy theory, ideology, or uh, at least when you come from a market, from a macroeconomic point of view. And, and in ruble, obviously, we have seen recently uh, very, very high interest rates there as well. They're coming down at the moment. Uh, and it's a special case, but the basic point here that that uh, there's a moment when risk premium are rising again uh, after a long period of having invested too much is, is quite clearly there. And I'm pretty sure that this is this is potentially an even greater opportunity, these kind of uh, investments than, than uh, trying to figure out who is going to hike most in, in G10 space. Uh, it's also more the style of buy and hold investment where you will face sharp sell-offs every now and then. Uh, this is always the same case when you do when you do carry. Uh, there will be sharp corrections uh, simply because people will be over-invested and then everybody's running for the same exit door. But uh, the, if the risk premium are high enough, and that's the key point here, uh, if, if not enough people, if not many people do it, 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 will, be, it will be a great investment uh, over time. And, and at this point, um, I will close it. I think I've overrun already the time <laughs> I wanted to talk. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you're, you're uh, too passionate about the topic, so I, I, I was expecting this. Um, yeah, maybe if you stop sharing and then we can uh, have some questions because we have several questions that are being asked. 
um, you know how to uh, stop the present. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, no, it's great, Thomas. Thanks. No, look, th thanks for this. And and I think you know what is interesting is uh, there is an interdependence. Like when we think about inflation, what I understood from you that okay, inflation is the core, but then there is an interdependence between currency and interest rate. It's not you know people think directionally on interest rate and what interest is going to be, but there is this also central bank. Uh, policy, they are thinking about the currency management, if I understood that correctly. Um, the yes. second the second part that, and, and that's something to keep in mind, it's not something that, you know, people, most people think about. I think the second one is uh, we're moving for a, from a synchronization to desynchronization of the central bank policy, um, and it's going to generate different different way of addressing interest rate but what investors should look for is more the interest rate differential not the interest rate direction of the interest rate is the differential of interest rate and that's the uh, strategy to to do when it comes to currency management if that's if that's my understanding also is is correct there yeah it's i mean i i would say both really i mean the moment the moment the, the interest rates are on the move you have very very strong correlation to the currency as well so you you see you see the set and that's what we seen last last year for example one of the best performing uh, systematic strategies last year was actually to look at uh, uh, inflation shocks over the last 12 months so the logic there was that if, if a central bank was being surprised by high inflation they were going to hike rates faster, or markets were pricing faster rate hikes, and the currency was therefore going to appreciate. So you have this you have this very strong relationship between changes in interest rate and change in the currency. But then at some stage, when the differences are big enough, then you have pure carry kicking in. It's a slightly different logic behind there, but there you have people looking at okay, I've got I've got let's say a thousand dollars to invest, and I or I don't want to buy equities at the moment because they are not great. So I hold them in cash and I'm looking at US deposits and I earn 3% and we're not there yet, right? I mean, US deposits, I earn 3% in the ECB and Europe, I'm still only getting paid half a percent. So guess what? More people migrate with the dollar. So it's slightly different logic. So there you can have a situation where the currency continues to appreciate even though the interest rate no longer changed at all. But that's because you have already established the interest rate differential. Okay, so, great. so. That let, let's continue with that analogy because I want to bring it to, uh, you know, as investors, we are not specialists like you in the currency space. We don't follow that every day. So let's take the, you know, uh, the, the investor who would like to put a currency strategy in place. What, what kind of framework should they put in place considering that this is not a day-to-day -day trading strategy, is more of a framework for a portfolio that is a medium to long term? How should they think about the currency management there? Well, I would I would strongly focus on these valuation charts um, that I, that I showed earlier. Well, uh, or the the long term a currency inflation adjusted relative to long term averages, or a fair value model, or a purchasing power model, a PPP model. Uh, I think that's that's probably for someone who is for someone who is let's say have an international portfolio exposure, multiple countries. Um, uh, there it is it's often it's often the most important but um so a country that is very a currency that is very undervalued if you have assets in a country that's very undervalued you want to basically keep the currency exposure open because if the currency reappreciates you will benefit from that uh but in, in a country where the assets are very overvalued um or where the, where the, in a country where the currency is very overvalued you want to potentially put a hedge in place uh, you need to think about the cost of the hedge as well, because, uh, for example, if if uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, why uh, when interest rates are going up, the currencies are getting stronger, even if they're already overvalued, is also because hedging the overvaluation risk also becomes ever more expensive because you are uh, you are effectively having to pay the 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 the, uh, the interest to borrow the currency because you technically short this currency when you hedge, right? Um, so. Often the sweet spot is um, is one where uh, a currency is very overvalued, and then suddenly it starts to sh show significant signs of a slowdown, and the central bank is starting to signal that they're going to cut rates. That's the moment where we have the overvaluation and the interest rate direction going to the same direction. There's no point in shorting a currency or hedging a currency that is very overvalued uh, 
But where the economy is still roaring and everybody wants to have more of that investment and everybody ignores the valuation signal because the growth story looks so strong. You want to have basically an overvalued currency with a weakening or weak growth story. That's typically the moment when you want to have. So in the US, we're not there yet. Now, that's the point that I made, tried to make earlier. We might actually see the dollar still go stronger uh, uh, quite a bit more. And, uh, and uh, even though the, the long-term forecast that they already see the signs of weakening in the US economy, but hey, unemployment rate is still at record lows. <laughs> so the inflation so pressures about, are still there. How about when you think about this and you consider the current uh, currency? Let's take major ones, yeah, euro, sterling, dollar if i am investing uh, internationally would you say no need to hedge those three currencies today uh, or you would say some of them you would hedge them just your view from that perspective on on, on the major currencies yeah it depends a bit of, of what your base currency is obviously as well but but i would i would still keep dollar exposure open at the moment uh, so there was there was a bit of talk in the last few days when we had, we had this uh, yesterday or the day before we had the ecb Starting to show, uh, Lagarde put out a blog post post on Monday, and and uh, and she highlighted that interest rates are going to go positive by September, uh, almost certainly. Uh, so that got the euro a little bit of a boost, and the dollar came a bit under pressure on a on a broader basis. But I mean, we're talking about slightly positive. The, the Fed might at that point already be at two percent or so. So we I mean, mentioned the interest rate differential is going to be there and it's going to be very substantial. The pace of hiking is probably still in favor of the dollar for the foreseeable future. But I think we will probably see the dollar continue to strengthen, uh, maybe more slowly, maybe in a more choppy way, but until we see that the US economy is starting to slow down very clearly and uh, and and uh, and that the Fed has to consider just to start cutting rates. And that is not an easy call to be made at the moment because this policy is still very expansionary in the US, inflation pressures are very strong, and it's possible that we see that the inflated the economy is starting to slow and the Fed will yet continue to hike rates. So I see this as a possibility and that would even strengthen the dollar further in this situation. So dollar is still strong, Europe, almost by coincidence, probably potentially still a little bit weaker. Um, so it's not a, it's not going to be a rocket trade. I mean, we're not talking, you're talking about squeezing a little bit more out of the undervalued euro and a little bit more out of the overvalued dollar. But but uh, but but that would be my bias. The UK is a really interesting one because uh, the way the UK consumers are hit is so bad at the moment uh, that the Bank of England really is clueless. Uh, but I think everybody, and I mean, not blaming, uh, not, despite the bad communication, I'm not blaming them because it's a really tough one at the moment for the UK, uh, for the Bank of England. And um, and inflation at 10%, but a steamroller going to hit the consumers at the end of the year with further increases in energy prices. Uh, I mean, I can see I can see how sterling is going to be one of the first ones where we see uh, a very significant, uh, like the central bank is basically saying we're done. Um, we're looking through the inflation that we see at the moment. The underlying economy is so weak uh, that we're not going to hike any further. And I think that would be a scenario where sterling would be very weak. Uh, and then we're not talking, not even talking about the politics in the UK at the moment and uh, and the uh, and uh, and the Brexit impact on on the economy, the collapsing trade numbers in the UK, all of these things are also working in the background still. But I'm just I'm really focusing only here on the interest rate policy and the Bank of England. So, um, uh, yeah. And, so uh, this... we have we have a question on which you touched on, but maybe to reaffirm what your view is on the on the U Euro USD par parity and uh, what are we gonna <laughs> are we gonna see that? You know? Yeah, I, again, it's, as I said, it's it's pushing a little bit. It's pushing it a little bit because it's now quite weak already. But um, I don't think the fundamental uh, uh, the fundamental case for a turnaround is there yet. So I parity. I never look look at the interest rate differentiation and how markets price and how quickly these banks react, etc. I can imagine uh, that about the end of the year, roughly, is the moment when you have most obvious difference in, in, in policy. Uh, I, I think at that stage, the Fed will have to have accelerated even further what they're doing uh, or add a lot more. So markets might be pricing at the end of the year, I think market might be pricing a terminal rate for the Fed fund and more like 5% rather than the 3% plus at the moment. Uh, 
Um, and the ECB, I'm not quite sure. There's a lot of demand destroyed in Europe uh, because of the high energy prices. So the ECB might actually not have to do all that much. So I think we, there's a, there's a likelihood that we get sub parity around that time at the end of the year. So I would give a probability of like 70%. And so uh, a lot can happen. The markets are very volatile and the confidence levels are wide. But but I would guess you get some parity in your dollar, yes. Yes. And and yen have depreciated a lot. I think it's at the weakest point in 20 years. So what do you think of that one and the central bank policy in uh, Japan? Yes. So this is a really interesting one. Um, so obviously, I mean, it makes sense uh, given the Everything I said so far in terms of policy differences, why we're having this big move, why we had this big movement again, and it, it's potentially going to continue. But the valuation signals on the yen are really extreme at the moment. Uh, so the yen is more undervalued than, I don't know, I, I wouldn't check this, but it's probably the last 30, 40 years. So we're not far off from undervaluation, like record historic undervaluation that we're seeing right now. Um, uh, it's not in absolute, not in nominal levels because Japan has always lower inflation rates and therefore the yen has a tendency to gradually appreciate. But um, but relative to its fair value, which is probably more than in these, in somewhere in the ninety area, also it's extremely weak. Uh, so yen is interesting to watch because the Japanese will get an enormous boost on the export industry at that level. There isn't that much export industry in Japan anymore, but. But uh, it's possible that the Bank of Japan will suddenly also start to worry, and then we see this reversal. So we might see this point that I mentioned before: extreme undervaluation, central bank suddenly catching up, and then a sharp move back. Uh, because the yen is such a universal funding currency, we have a history of ma major, major sharp moves in the yen once it comes from this extreme undervaluation. Uh, I remember the '98 uh, collapse of the yen carry trade. I remember the 2008. Uh, collapse of the or 2007 actually it was a year before the uh, before the global financial crisis the 2007 blow up in the yen carry trade in each case the yen market becomes literally dysfunctional you can't trade it anymore because everybody wants to sell uh, buy it back at the time uh, so something I like guess is quite possibly going to happen within the next one or two years I would say um, so it could be the first one of these big sharp reversals uh, but but I would also highlight what is really interesting in Japan is that Despite what I just said, inflation is not really a big problem in Japan yet. Uh, so they're having a little bit of high inflation, but they're not having the 10% that you see in the US. And that's important to keep in mind when we look at the G10 currencies uh, and inflation situation, because, because the situation in the 1970s and 80s, from a demographic point of view in the Western world, was very different than it is at the moment. So there's a lot of inflation in the 1970s and 80s, which is driven just by super strong demographics, baby boomers hitting the labor market, et cetera, et cetera. Strong demand in the economy, that's gone basically. So maybe the Western world looks a little bit more like Japan. So we might have a short-term burst in inflation and it might actually come down quite strongly. That's the question I asked myself, but, um, but um, it's... Uh... Um, so uh, the, you know, we had Jim O'Neill, uh, your ex-colleague at Goldman, and he, as we all know, he invented the brick and looking at it from a 20 year, from now, if I was to ask you what would be your brick in the currency world, uh, what would the, which currency would that be? <laughs> um, it doesn't need to be five. It doesn't need to be an acronym. But <laughs> yeah, that's five interesting. Five the next Twenty years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think you. Um, I mean, it's a question of you just thinking in terms of appreciation when you take in, in terms of return opportunities. I think, I think there will be, I think I would go back to the chart in, about emerging market currencies that, that I mentioned uh, earlier before. I think, I think there are a number of countries uh, that have so catastrophically weak and unsustainable fundamentals at the moment and investors have been reacting accordingly that we will see their uh, massive policy turnaround. So Turkey, Turkey is, for example, a country it has fantastic demographics. It has reasonably well-educated population. Um, it's it's always been at the verge of potentially joining Europe. It is it is close to a major major trading block. It has fantastic potential. It's a fast-growing economy, but it's so badly managed at the moment uh, that that once the current government is gone, and eventually this will happen, like in every country, a uh, government will disappear. And sometimes comes in with a more orthodox policy. I can imagine that Turkey could be an absolutely fantastic investment. 
Um, so uh, it's 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 not a it's not a. I mean, we are not at that point yet, right? Um, I, I would be I would be a bit careful, but um, but. Um, what about Chinese renminbi? I, I would have thought you would say this first. It's so controlled. The Chinese are uh, look. There's always this debate about China becoming the next reserve currency, right? Um, the problem is, in order to become a reserve currency, you need to be willing for foreigners to hold your currency. And that means basically you need to be willing for foreigners to invest in your country, which creates appreciation pressures in the first place. Or you need to run large external deficits so that you just pay everything in the rest of the world with your currency, that other people get extra your currency to hold it as a reserve currency. And so the Chinese doesn't want you, don't want to do that. They don't want to have a large current account deficit. So they don't want to they don't want to import a large amount of it. And, and they don't want foreigners to invest in large scale in in uh, in, in China. And, and if they invest, then they put it into the foreign exchange reserve, meaning they invest it back in the U.S. Treasury market. So I, I don't see how China can become a reserve currency as long as this kind of policy preferences are in place. And I don't see them change anything soon. I, I think, the, yeah. No, the no, I would think undervalued. The yeah. big undervalued G3 currencies, I mean, the yen and, and euro, they are there to be looked at. Uh, the dollar is historically very strong, uh, but this is more like a five year story rather than like a, a secular brick story over 20, 30 years or so. Yeah. Um, What's your view on commodity currencies? So Aussie, uh, New Zealand, Canadian dollar. Well, they are obviously at the intersection at the moment of having a positive terms of trade shock and having inflation pressures. So uh, in many, many cases, uh, if you look at what's going uh, on in agricultural prices globally and you look at New Zealand, uh, so there are many reasons why these countries need to see their currencies uh, appreciate quite significantly. So yes, they, they are among those where this case of central banks and small open economies letting the currencies appreciate a lot is particularly strong, so I, I, I see I see them as as uh, as obvious candidates. But then again, the RBA in Australia Sorry, was very obvious, obvious candidate to continue to appreciate, I, or obvious continue candidate. to appreciate. Okay. No, no, continue to appreciate because because the central banks will have to hike more uh, because of this of this double need if you want to so the economy potentially going into overdrive. Investment in Australia, for example, is going to accelerate. Uh, in, in, in the gas sector, in, uh, in, in, in some of the commodity, uh, energy-related commodity sectors. Uh, so Western Australia is probably going to strengthen significantly again. Um, the RBA is still very dovish, uh, changing tack, but inflation pressure is going up. The Australian Prime Minister just lost his job because inflation is too high in Australia. I mean, inflation is a big problem in Australia, so they will hike a lot more. The Aussie dollar has potential to, to be among the stronger performers in, in G10 space on, on that basis. Yeah. And what's your, yeah, no, you want to, yeah. I was going to say, one of the things that's it's important to keep in mind for, for the medium term, though, when you see that interest rates are going up, and in again, in the context of, 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 uh, of currency markets, is that there are a number of countries in the world which have extremely high debt levels. And if interest rates are going up, then debt sustainability is going to become a problem potentially. So the, obviously, Italy is always in the list. We have a couple of European peripheral countries in there. Uh, uh, and they will be have they we will have to see what the ECB is doing if they want to hike rates and they don't want to destroy Italy at the same time. So that will be a very interesting thing to watch out for. But let's also not forget that the US has a very big debt problem now. So the government debt in the US is 130% debt to GDP ratio, uh, the highest it's ever been. And uh, and the maturity in the government, the debt mach no, the government. Um, the portfolio, the, the, the treasury, the maturity in the treasury market is very short, only about five years. The interest rates are going up a lot in the US. The US treasury will have a big refunding problem at some stage. So we might be talking in two or three years again about twin deficits and about the need uh, that the US has an external deficit, has a large budget deficit, uh, and the budget deficit will be largely from interest rate, interest rate payments. It's not spending, it's just interest rate payments. And then they will be having to tighten monetary policy, you know, fiscal policy, potentially raise taxes just to pay back the debt. So it's a very bad uh, long-term growth outlook potentially looming there. So it needs to be seen. <laughs> Not there yet, but I mean, a lot of these things are falling into place on a, on a three or four year horizon potentially. So exciting times in ethics. Okay, two, two more questions. One um, on the Russia 
more the political uh, event we've seen and how do you reflect on this from the currency controls or uh, you know just the political risk that we've seen is that something that now you you have you are considering or is something that you've seen in the past we'd love to hear your thoughts on on this how you reflect no, it's, on yeah it's a it's a it's one of these um, macroeconomic lab cases almost when you have this extreme this extreme situation so so it's very difficult to say with the embargoes um, uh, have basically screwed up um, uh, the forward markets in, in, in Russia at the moment. So one of the reasons why the returns in this EM strategy that I showed earlier were so high is because the, the, the implied rates in, uh, in for forward markets, and it's, it's virtually impossible to trade in large and active side. I think it's potentially possible for non-EU residents or non-US dollar, US residents uh, to potentially build a long position in the ruble uh, because of embargo and all kinds of rules. I actually I actually don't know. This is really technical questions for the brokers to know. But but the, the implied interest rate at the moment on the on the ruble, depending on whether you look against the euro or against the dollar, are somewhere between 80, 80 and 120 percent per annum. Uh, so there is there is uh, there is potentially extremely high returns to be made. Um, and I'm not talking about the ethics here and the morals of buying Russian assets uh, and whether this is acceptable or not. Um, that's that's a decision that everybody needs to make, I guess, uh, individually. But but the, the the premium there is extremely high. But what's also interesting is what you could see is what how the balance of payment works in in Russia. That was really interesting because what happens is after the war uh, was was started or, this, or the attack on on, on uh, Ukraine started. The initial response was for Russians and uh, presumably people who are wealthy in Russia to put money abroad. So the ruble collapsed initially and very significantly. But Russia had an open capital account. And despite an enormously large current account surplus due to the carbon, uh, hydrocarbon exports, uh, there was so much capital outflow that the ruble collapsed well above 100 uh, um, ruble per dollar. Then the government closed the capital account, forced uh, basically every exporter to redeem uh, any export revenues into your into ruble, and this is as, as if you were having just suddenly from the dominating capital account in your balance when you go to the huge current account surplus, which only drove the exchange rate. And so we're now at fifty or so. I mean, they are now struggling to to prevent the ruble from appreciating any further because you see suddenly how how in isolation. A large current account surplus is actually supporting a currency, which brings us a little bit to, back to the chart I showed earlier about the about the U.S. trade balance. But the moment the capital account is no longer offsetting these imbalances, you have massive pressures on the currencies at the time. In the ruble case, it's appreciation. In the dollar case, it will ultimately become a depreciation. Um, not yet, obviously. But so so yeah. So the ruble is the ruble is an opportunity if you can and if you want to invest it. But potentially the trade is over already because uh, it's now probably overvalued given the strong strong appreciation. Um, so it's yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a difficult one. <laughs> it's a difficult one, I have to say. So <clears throat> uh, I said I have two more, but I will add one more. So um, what are and from your experience the characteristics of a good currency investor? What traits a what, currency investor have? So, so someone who's investing in currencies, you mean? Yes, someone who's successful, talented, who's good. A successful currency portfolio manager, a successful currency investor. Yes. You've, met, you've met, you've worked in this field. What are the characteristics, the character needed to be successful? So, so um, uh, this critically depends on the market conditions. So uh, a good currency investor uh, in the last five or six, seven years was someone who uh, had very different skill set from what a good currency investor is going to be in the next three, four, five years, in my view. Uh, so it depends really on the market position. So we are, we're, heading, we're heading into an environment with big risk premium, with big trends, uh, a lot of momentum, uh, sharp reversals. Uh, so that's more like the traditional macro trading style. So people who are, and I think a lot of macro hedge funds have barely done any FX trading in the last five to 10 years, 
will be moving back and do a lot more FX trading because of that. It's it's more the the market. It's not that they're it's, their style is pretty much fixed. They're trend following mainly or momentum trading, but the, they will find the markets that work for that. And so the currency market will become more like that. So but I think I think traditional uh, traditional uh, funds. Will be, if you look at a longer perspective, um, uh, you need to. In general, I would say currency markets are just so incredibly difficult uh, because there's so many more moving parts than in most other markets where you have like uh, all these currencies, all these markets coming together. Uh, there's only one price connecting two economies, right? It's this one exchange rate and whatever transaction is going through this is one part. So a lot of influences come through. But I think in the, in the long run, the guys who are who are successful and has to survive, survive in currency markets, they're just very critical with themselves. And, constantly question the assumptions and are constantly trying to see what has changed, how has the market adopted and, uh, and, and, uh, and are not, not very dogmatic about, uh, about their approach. Uh, I think it's also important and, and it's a good reason for that. It's important to realize that the liquidity in currency markets is so absolutely ginormous compared to the macroeconomic fundamentals that most of the time the capital account and the capital flows dominate everything else. This is the Russia example I mentioned earlier. So you really need to be most of the time very sensitive to um, what other people think is a good trade rather than what you think is a good trade. So there's kind of the Cajun beauty contest. And But every now and then you flip into an environment where really the macro is a pure driving force. And it doesn't really matter all that much what people think, often because people look focused on something else. So you need to be humble and be able to switch back and forth. That would be my that would be my uh, my thinking. So. Uh, um, okay, thank you. So, last question is uh, is maybe one that everybody wanted to hear uh, in the beginning, because everyone wants to know whether a currency is going to appreciate or depreciate in value. So let's let's have a let's have a game, Thomas, at the end. Um, <laughs> it's, it's currency USD. I'm going to yes. name a currency. You're going to have a view over twelve months, and you're going to tell me stronger or weaker. So okay. Let's let's do one test. Euro. Uh, next uh, month weaker. Okay, so you ready? We'll we'll do we'll do some of them now. Okay, uh, I need to do this really quickly, right? I've got two seconds every time. Or so. Here you go. You cannot think. Okay, so <laughs> we'll, instinct. We'll start again. Okay, Euro. go on then. Euro. Euro is weaker. Sterling. Uh, weaker. Yen. Uh, stronger. Swiss franc. Uh, stronger. Canadian dollar. Uh, stronger. Ruble. Uh, weaker. Chinese renminbi. Uh, weaker. Turkish lira. Uh, weaker. Okay, last one. Saudi rial. <laughs> Unchanged. <laughs> it's packed. <laughs> you passed the test. <laughs> Thomas, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Look, I think one of the major takeaway for me is, and I would let you also give your uh, last comments. But for me, is is what I under, what I learned today is that also in the currency space, the tools that we have been using in the past are no longer the tools that we can use in in the next three to five years. And we've been telling investors we're going to be living in a new phase. We have been discussing with investors since the beginning of the year that a new phase requires new tools. And in our business, we think about uh, the tools and asset allocation. And we have to now add to this toolkit the currency management, because what you've just described to us is that the new phase, there will be a new phase of currency, and we need to be also using this in our asset allocation. So that's a big takeaway for me. Um, I would let you conclude. And uh, sorry if we ran around an hour, but just because Thomas was so passionate, he took 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes, but uh, we wanted also to have you the chance to ask your yeah. question. So Thomas, okay, sure. if you have any, anything to, to say at the end? No, I think I think the the one point um, it flipped in one of the charts through and you just, it, it ties really not neatly into, into what you said. So when you when you really focus on currency markets, you can only ever be long a currency if you short another currency. So the idea of having 
you're not really exposed to risk premium. I mean, you have some strategies where you can do that when you look at the M, et cetera. But by and large, when you're in currency investors, you're, you can skew the risk profile as you want. And often, uh, and, and, uh, and it's at times when most assets go through a phase of deleveraging, where you have bonds going down, where you're having equities going down, where you have real estate going down, where you have a lot of things going down because we are going in a broad deleveraging phase. Currencies are one of those areas where, by the nature of being long one and short the other, you can actually extract some alpha and can generate some diversification benefit in, in portfolios. So it's 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 obviously part of the traditional macro world, and I'm I'm more in the FX part of that. But but I would uh, I would very strongly uh, I would very strongly advocate thinking about that as a way to 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 protect partly. Uh, portfolios uh, in, in a very different environment, in a difficult environment uh, in, in the years and month and years to come potentially. Right? Great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, we hope to see you next in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.